Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. We're quickly transitioning. I want you to look up in the balcony. Would you look up in the balcony? Those are our football players. Football players, would you stand? Would you stand? They come to chapel every week. Would all the students stand? All VUU students. And there are more that are coming. We're transitioning. I'm asking the choir to come on and get in place. I'm asking the band to jam out. We're getting ready to get started. We're under the gun. We're under the gun. We're grateful for everything that has happened. Be in prayer for the football team. They play uh, Saturday. They are in, uh, they're in playoffs, praise God. I said praise God. And then the basketball team was in a tournament in uh, 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 Connecticut, and they won the whole thing. We invite you now to the part of our spiritual formation where we take care of the undergrad division. And so we've got to worship with them. Amen? And we want to thank you for sharing this with us. We're going to let the band jam for a second as we prepare in just three minutes to start this phase of our chapel service. The choir is coming. Don't they look good? Usually they are all robed up. Usually I'm all robed up, but they told me because of the lights uh, that they are, they're not going to robe today. And so we're working with them. They sound great. You'll get to hear them in a second. Uh, to all of our students, do not get stiff on me now. Come down and do your QR code and check in while we jam out. All of our students are coming now. They're doing the QR code. Kenzel, we want to get started in just a second. So would you come? They're checking in for chapel. This is the way we do it. I know I heard all your stories about the slips. I'm from the slip generation. We've advanced to something else now, a QR code. Students check in and stay. We're going to get started in two minutes. Just two minutes, we're going to get started. All students, please make sure you check in. Football team, we already got y'all taken care of. Remember that we are in spiritual formation. I would remind you that we are still in spiritual formation. You are, you are still in your holy moment. The students are coming and they're sitting. I'm going to invite now one of our chapel assistants. We have a chapel assistance program here that trains young men and women for leadership roles in the greater global world. Uh, and we have one who's going to invite everyone to the chapel now, one of our chapel assistants. Kenzel, would you come? Uh, would you come and just greet the people? Kenzel Pugh? Kenzel, is he? I don't see him. Would you welcome uh, Sister Georgia is going to come. She's also one of our chapel assistants. Come on, Georgia. Ow. Good morning. That hurt. Good morning. Special good morning to STVU, to Virginia Union University undergrad. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to welcome you all to our weekly chapel. Um, we have something that we do here. Um, it is called our Centering Moment. So if you would please join us. Um, so I will say Sabona, and then you would say Yebo, Yebo, Sabona. And Sabona simply means, if I'm going to paraphrase, we see you, we acknowledge you, we recognize that you are here. So I'm going to ask if we all just please stand as we do this. All right, Sabona. Y'all got it, so I'm gonna do it one more time. So I'm gonna say Sabona, and your response is Yebo, Yebo, Sabona. Okay, you all ready? Sabona. Thank you, you may be seated.
Good morning, good morning, good morning to our VUU students. Welcome to chapel service once again. Thank you so much for coming and doing your duties by scanning the QR code. And welcome Ellison Jones to our chapel service. Would you mind rising on your feet as we go to God in prayer? Most gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for your loving kindness and for your tender mercy. We thank you that you woke us up this morning. We thank you that you give us new mercies every morning. Great is your faithfulness toward us. Lord, we're thankful to be in this sacred space this morning to fellowship with STVU and VUU undergrad students for a fellowship service. Now, Father, we ask that your spirit continue to be in this place. Move through every aisle, move from every heart and from breast to God. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing now. We thank you for the speaker this morning. We ask you to anoint her with a fresh word. And Lord, let her be able to preach with power, anointing, and conviction. Lord, set our souls afire this morning. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's in Jesus' miraculous name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. Awesome. How many have been having a great time this week? That's great. So I have the privilege of introducing um, one of the two individuals that I sit under, uh, Dr. Richard Price, um, as a chapel assistant along with my colleague, uh, Mr. Kinzel. So I'm just gonna do a brief bio and he's gonna come say a few words. Dr. Richard Price serves as the Dean of Chapel, Director of Faith-Based Giving and Professor. He is an ordained minister of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and has served non-denominational congregations rooted in the Christian restoration tradition in Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and New York. Dr. Price earned a Bachelor of Art in History from Livingstone College, a Master of Arts in American History from St. John's University, a Master of Religious Leadership and Administration, and a Doctor of Ministry from New York Theological Seminary. His dissertation was re-examining early prophetic African-American voices in the Church of Christ, a best practice model for community engagement. Dr. Price is currently in his fifth term as the chairman of the Mayor's Outreach Task Force and appointed official liaison between citizens, city officials, and law enforcement agencies. He is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the National Urban League, and has received numerous civic awards. Most recently, the mayor of Tupelo, Todd Jordan, proclaimed May 29, 2022 as Dr. Richard Price Day for his advocacy and leadership throughout the community. I now introduce to you and present to others Dr. Richard Price. Thank you. I know that was strange because you're like, he back? Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you so much to our university community. Uh, it's already been said uh, by Dean Guns that he stands on the shoulders uh, of a giant. Uh, but I also want to say that in the chapel space, I stand on the shoulders of a giant as well. Uh, Dr. Chapman is here. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, while he can receive it, give him his flowers. Our university pastor emeritus for 30 plus years, the Reverend Dr. Chapman. And I just wanted to get that out because uh, it has been wonderful to work alongside of him. He is now one of my fathers in this avenue of ministry. I want to thank our president, Dr. Lucas, who is also a father in this avenue of ministry. 
I want to thank Dr. Guns, who's also a big brother uh, in this avenue of ministry. And also, I want to share a reflection as we get going, just for one minute, because we've saved 20 minutes. You saw the way we expedited. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Kenny and his wife yesterday while we were going through the presentation and panel. Uh, I was sitting right there beside his wife. And uh, I was trained in the black church tradition, which says, be ready to serve, right? And I just happened to have one of my handkerchiefs in my pocket. And when he was moved by the responses of his students, I ran with my handkerchief. Uh, and I had not seen my handkerchief, but I kept saying to myself, I'm glad I was prepared. I'm glad I was prepared. And then while I was in the, in the north ex of the chapel, as he and his wife were coming in, he put in my hand, like the church mothers used to do that $20 when you were visiting home from college break. And he balled up two brand new handkerchiefs in my hand. And guess what he said? He said, press down, shaken together. And he said, this is double for your trouble. And I just want to tell him, thank you. He's been watching me out the corner of his eye. And I appreciate that. Enough about me. Y'all want to worship. And I want you to hear our university choir. They're coming right now. I just want to say thank you for supporting chapel. Any Thursday you want to come, this, this is how it is. And so the choir is coming right now. Uh, they have a fantastic director. Uh, they got out of wearing their robes today. Uh, usually we're robed up, but I want you to jam with them. Invite them to your churches. Invite them because they are just terrific. And we thank God for everything that Dean Guns is doing, everything that that division is doing. Uh, and we bless God even now. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> We thank God for being with you all here on today. We just um, ask that you pray for us as we sing these quick selections. Um, if you know this song for the rest of my life, you can feel free to get on your feet and sing with us. We come to magnify the Lord. Psalms 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And whether you're in his house or whether you're out his house, let's make that determination to serve the Lord, amen. Come on and put those hands together.
Y'all can clap for about 30 more seconds. Come on. Clap hard. Clap like the devil is in between your hands. Come on, give the Lord praise, everybody. Hallelujah. What a tremendous week we've had on the beautiful, sacred, hollow grounds and walls of the Virginia Union University campus. For students who are here, uh, this has been our Ellison Jones Week, our signature gathering, our, our, our communiversary, as President Lucas calls it, and so we've been here since Monday, and we always conclude Ellison Jones in worship with the students. Before I go any further, can we all st stand, turn, look at the balcony, and clap for the best football team in the country? Oh, come on, y'all. We need y'all to bring that championship home. Come on, let's celebrate. Virginia Union's highly ranked football team. I don't know if you're supposed to pray for a football team, but we're going to be praying this weekend. We are super proud of you guys. Thank y'all for bringing, for shining a positive light on Virginia Union University. Everything has been intentional this week. And from nothing else, I try to be intentional. And every, every move and shift and nuance of this week, I believe, has been orchestrated and ordained by God. This, this final voice for 2022. Um, she's an assistant professor of preaching, practical theology at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. She's a virtual pastor, uh, the Pink Road Chronicles, uh, digital Hush Harbor. She's a graduate of, of Virginia Union class of 1994. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Thank God for the one person from 94. Okay, two. But, but more importantly, she has one of the most unique voices in the body of Christ. She does an amazing job of managing academy with, with church, black church, and it is navigated by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to, as kind of a final response to every preacher this week, every presenter, would you stand and receive Dr. Melba Sampson as she comes? All right, my sister. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, hallelujah, that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. You may take your seats. Protocol has already been established. You all were learning about your emotional intelligences and stuff. Amen. It sounded like a wonderful lesson. Amen. And so the preacher who is last always meets the conundrum of, really, of, of whether to forge ahead or take her time. And so I'm going to try to do a little bit of both. I want to acknowledge, shout out to the football team, shout out to all of the alum, shout out to my friends, Joe Fleming. I know that was you probably shout for the class of 94. Amen, somebody. Shout out to this. Don't the gospel choir look good, Joe Fleming? Remember that that was us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, to all of my friends, uh, it has been really an HBCU homecoming week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to my sister and colleague, whom I do not see, but wherever you are, to the Reverend Dr. Marquita Carmichael, um, I recognize you, Ashe. 
I know, I know your work everywhere. That Sawabona has to have come from you. So shout out to, to you, to you, to you, um, to Dean Kinney, um, to, to uh, Reverend Chapman, to Dean Guns, to everybody and somebody, amen. The word of the Lord comes from the book of Hebrews. Owing to my husband on the Zoom. Hey, boo. <laughs> the book of Hebrews. <laughs> And to the Pink Robe Chronicles virtual community, shout out to all of you all. Amen. Uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, I'm moving around, but around about uh, verses 32 through 39, listen for a word from the Lord. But recall those earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to insults and afflictions, and sometimes becoming partners with those treated the same. Do not therefore abandon that boldness of yours for you need Stephanie endurance so that when you have done the will of God Melek you may receive what was promised but we are not Carla and Kim and Reggie and Marcus and Joe and Michael but we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost but we are amongst those who have faith and so are saved Thank you, God, for doing what you're about to do with this word. Amen. Some experiences are too painful to remember, but are too harmful to forget. That is, we tend to only bask in the benefit our victories yield instead of studying the strategic process that made the victory possible. As a result, our communities wrestle with a fatigued faith because we have forgotten to re-hyphen member not what brought us over, but how we got over. The loss of memory reduces our ability to radically examine ourselves, our ancestors, and the opportunities we create for future generations. And when we fail to remember who we are, then we allow ourselves to be convinced that we don't have any spiritual power. So for the few moments that I am assigned to or the moments that are assigned to me, I want to issue a charge. Remember who you are. Look at the person next to you, in front of you, and back of you, left or right, and simply say to them, remember who you are. And because I am new to many of you, I was raised to never enter a space, any kind of space, without speaking, without locating myself, without locating my roots never into a room without saying hello. And so it is important for me because I imagine that for some of you, this might be a new hearing, a new learning, and you might want to do some more digging or you might want to figure out where is she coming from with this? And so it's important that I tell you who I am. I am a womanist inspired by the revolutionary witness of the African Messiah, Yeheshua Hamashiach, Jesus. To be womanist is to be both Afrocentric and Afrofuturist, to make a central starting point at the, and the viable subject, Black African cultural and spiritual traditions, to not only imagine, but perform as a living and breathing Black future, wherein salvation lies within Black women's lived experiences and prophetic utterances. So to this end, in my preaching, I preach not to save folks so that they will live in the next life without the pain of this one because they fulfilled all of their religious obligations, but I preach to emancipate many from a type of church industrial complex where souls desiring for their humanity to be acknowledged and accepted are on lockdown and pews held captive by councils and boards where where men hold primary power and predominate the roles of political leadership and moral authority and social privilege. That's called patriarchy, where they're held captive by those who distrust 
hatred and downright dislike black women. That's called misogyny uh, and held captive by black bodies who pronounce and proclaim the same oppressive theology of white supremacists and white supremacist apologists. Y'all, that's called white theology in blackface. Uh, all because they challenge the pulpit as an exclusive symbol of phallic power that excludes non-cisgender, non-heterosexual, neurodivergent, differently abled and non-male bodies. In short, I am a spiritually malleable black woman who practices what the Reverend Dr. Earl Fisher coined as sermonic militancy, which means, quote, unapologetic proclamation of holy rage and holy hope, intentional in pronouncing black truth in light of the power dynamics in a social and political context, end quote. It is from this location that I offer this text. In case you have been so heavily minded, in case you have been so heavenly minded with the things of God and you haven't noticed, in case you've been hitting the books hard, trying to make that GPA for membership intake, if you know, you know, uh, in case you've been undergoing, you know, a personal storm of sorts and have not had the capacity to take on any additional weight, I submit to you this morning that we are living in red hot critical times. In Eight Bowls Full of Life, Makungu M. Akingele defines red hot critical times as, quote, those moments that come without warning or compassion for the needs of African diaspora and people, end quote. Since our capture from the West Coast of Africa, our journey across the transatlantic and our arrival to the Americas, Africans in America have labored for humanization. Despite the physical, spiritual, and cultural resistance of many enslaved women, men, and children, the gains achieved by the Southern Civil Rights and Black Power and Black Lives Matters movement, and the election of an African-American president in 2008, the election of the first woman of African and Indian descent, an HBCU graduate, and a divine non-member to be elected as vice president of these United States, and a first Black woman confirmed as a justice on the highest court in the land, despite all of these, as Reverend Dr. Stewart said last night, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd were still murdered. Murdered by racists, neighborhood vigilantes, and law enforcement, and even in death, justice remains elusive for Black women, as the murders of Arbery and Floyd, the murderers, of Arbery and Floyd were charged, convicted, found guilty, and issued lengthy sentences, while the police who murdered Brianna were reprimanded for shooting into a nearby unit instead of shooting her in her bed. We're living in red hot critical times. WNBA player Brittany Griner remains still in a Russian penal colony. Black maternal health disparities are taking the lives of too many Black women. Clean water and inalienable right continues to be elusive for not only Flint, Michigan, but also in Illinois and Jackson, Mississippi. The COVID-19 pandemic ushered in job losses, which were greater for people of color, many of whom lack savings to cushion the financial blow. And longstanding issues of underperforming public schools and gaps in digital infrastructure exacerbate learning losses among Black children. Each of these instances solidify the occurrences that illuminate this fact, that the struggle for Black livelihood persists through today. There has been no easing of this tension, only a deafening worsening. Black lives continue to be compromised in extreme and disheartening ways. Mama Dr. Iva Carruthers illuminates this tension, writing, quote, unresolved racial and I add gender, sexuality, and ableist inequities show that the United States is plagued with killings and murders of Black lives with impunity by the outright egregious actions of agents of local, county, and state governments. 
both the goal and the sustained outcome of oppression most visible in red hot and critical times is to create distance between the oppressed and their spiritual, cultural, and physical power. In African origin, Senegalese scholar Sheikh Antejoub said this about the powers of domination. He said, quote, for people to oppress other people, there are three things that you need to take from them. One, you take their history. Two, you take their language. Three, you take their psychological factor. That is, if you are the oppressor, you take what Leonard Jeffries expressed as a people's values, entries, and principles, and you superimpose your history, your language, your values, and your interests upon them. And no matter what conclusion they come to in the challenge they face, they will always act in the interest of the oppressor that took their history, their language, and their values. To this end, we need preachers, we need faculty, we need administrators, we need staff, we need students, we need football team players, we need community members, we need homies in them, we need the folk who will embrace the voices of the past Dean Guns and bring together the pieces of the broken gourd to go into the wound of spiritual apathy and cultural amnesia, to go into the wound of Black what, what Black feminist sociologist Patricia Hill Collins calls the matrix of domination most visible in interlocking systems of oppression. What are they? Sexism and racism and homophobia and ableism to go into the wounds of self and collective abnegation, self-doubt and self-fear and disregard to do what Dr. Itihari, whom I reverently and respectfully refer to as Mama Itihari said, is to recover from surviving, to remember who we are. I am returning this morning then to these hallowed grounds and dear old walls to encourage not only the preachers who have been gathering this week to recalibrate and to restore, uh, to, to, to recalibrate and to restore as we consider preaching matters, uh, to be a follower of Jesus then is to be opposite of the empire. It is less about how pious you are because you call in the wrong kind of fast anyway. Come on and go back to Isaiah. But it is more about an awareness of radical communal responsibility. And those who understand this know that this way of knowing and being in a world hell bent on the demise of the least of these is not for the faint of heart. It is not for the fickle or the feeble. When you decide that you will use your sacred memory to unify black folk, the empire and those who gain from its positioning will place you in its crosshairs. This is the case for the audience in Hebrews. <laughs> they are in red and hot critical times <laughs> and they have forgotten who they are. Uh, the delay of the final return of Jesus has had a demoralizing effect on the community. The sky has not cracked open and the angels have not descended. The Hebrew community is waiting, but in the meantime, life keep life in. You know how that is. You're waiting on God and you're waiting on God and all the while life keeps having its way with you. Uh, death dealing blows and unexpected news continues to greet you at your front door uh, and all manner of situations seem to come at you. Uh, they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and all the while the empire continues to strike back. As a result, some Jewish Christians don't miss that. As a result, some, come on and learn. Some Jewish Christians return to Judaism for the security of a long and established tradition. (laughs) 
because life started lifing and they had already been in darkened, catch it. Because the dean said, if we black, we got the light. So we're not really in light and we in dark. <laughs> the Jewish Christians returned to Judaism for the security of a long and established tradition or for government protection from persecution. The consequence of sight, of being able to see was imprisonment, confiscation of property and other heinous acts. Being a Christian in the first century was arduous and risky. You had to be initiated. Did you know y'all stay away from them kind of words? But it was a cult in the way we understand that in religious studies as a group with similar beliefs and belonging. It was risky. You couldn't just give your heart to God and give your hand to the pastor. <laughs> you had to journey, Reggie. You had to journey together for a period of time, usually a year or more, to make sure that you could withstand the consequences of putting the last first. The consequences of eating with the alleged ritually unclean. Why? Because they wanted to make sure that you wouldn't leave the assembly once things got hard. The community members in this text have grown lax in attendance at their assembly and their commitment to Jesus is waning because the empire is threatened by their message. They are suffering from cultural bias and religious profiling and innocent bodies are being stopped and frisked, ridiculed because they self-identify as followers of the way, followers of the now lynched Jesus. That'd be y'all glorifying that cross like that. <laughs> They were the minority within an empire with far reach. The audience in Hebrews, Marquita, were living under dictatorial rule. Many had come dangerously close to the edge of giving up. The killing of their sons and daughters did not matter as much as the killing of the sons and daughters of the ruling class. Half-baked policies coupled with bureaucratic backlash begin to give way to spiritual amnesia and political impotence. There's spirits had been broken. Their resolve was lethargy. They are suffering from a waning zeal most visible in their declining attendance at church. Some of them assimilated. <laughs> Others of them went into hiding. They stopped protesting. They stopped using their voices to speak against their cultural and religious oppression. Instead, they usurped the inevitability of pain for the option of misery. Their fear of ridicule from agents of the state overwhelmed them into silence. They struggle with both the lack of attention from the culture and the cultural favor given to the dominant power. So to shake them, from the despondency that comes when you are forced to take on dehumanizing positions that make you simultaneously feel powerless and enraged, the preacher offers memory as a tool of resistance. This memory is an alternative position. The writer says this, but recall the earlier days when you first were enlightened. Oh, y'all remember, you remember, especially us Baptist folk, we remember when we lifted up our hand by the, by the time we reached seven, amen, I'm a, I'm a traditional Baptist, by the time we reached seven, we, we could go on up, you know, and, but recall when you were first enlightened. The writer tells them to basically look backwards while standing forward. He offers them what the Akan people of Ghana, West Africa would call a Sankofa moment. Sankofa means to look to the past to gain insight for the present and future. 
The activation of memory then was basic to preaching in both the synagogue and then what would later be the church. And those days to be remembered in this ancient context were not necessarily good times. I want to help you on your way home. I want to help you on your way back to class. The recollection is of times of verbal and physical abuse, but times nevertheless when they were firm, bold, and sympathetic. The writer reminds the listener that their discomfort came after they were in darkness. We recall, we recall then to draw strength from our collective and individual stories of terror, to be reminded that it is the but that connects the what was of history and the now of the present. It is the but that connects us from the arrival of the early slaves to the Civil War from Reconstruction to Jim Crow. It is the but, ah, the but from the Great Depression and the Civil Rights era into the 21st century. Do we not, as a collective, people have a testimonial but? A history complete with stony roads and chastening rods, southern trees bearing strange fruit, blood on the leaves, and blood at the root, black bodies dangling from popular trees. The people deemed not a people singing their song in a foreign land, the descendants of racist personification in the form of sharecroppers and slaves and domestics and factory workers. Ours is a story that is cloaked in an indelible faith. Recalling in times of white heat and red hot critical times offers us strength so that we don't fall back, so that we don't shrink into despair. The fundamental ground for encouragement in this text this morning is in remembering the former days. I know that it is popular in popular psychology and other things to lead a past in the past. Don't worry about it. Just leave it all behind. You got to step into your now. You got to step out of yesterday and step into tomorrow. You got to spin around three times. You got to touch the ground, do a little twerk. You got to... The fundamental ground... For encouragement in this text, then, is in our ability to remember the former days. And listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat this thing for anybody. I ain't going to make you shout. You ain't about to do no cartwheel up in here. I'm not about to slay you. It's, it, I'm just, I, I don't, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> because the work before us is about to be daunting. This ain't a pretty situation. You don't say yes to this because you want to be seen. You don't say yes to this because you want your name called. You don't say yes to this because you want to be rich. You don't say yes to this because you want a 20,000 seat sanctuary. Those ain't even in style anymore. You don't say You say yes to this because there is something burning on the inside of you. You say yes to this because you didn't have a model. And guess what? When you're sitting in the meeting, you're going to try to be quiet. You're going to wake up in the morning and say your affirmations. Are you in the mirror? You're going to say, I am enough. I am beautiful. I am intelligent. I am smart. And I don't care what they say today. I am not opening my mouth. I am just going to sit here and listen. You are going to try to be quiet about a plethora of issues, but will rise up within you and you will find yourself speaking up when you want to be quiet. And in those moments, I want you to remember who you are. Essentially, I'm going to have to cut some things. Essentially, it is their memory of informed struggle that delivers confidence. And confidence brings forth perseverance. Hence, social and religious apathy is combated by boldness, endurance, and faith. 
35 says, do not therefore abandon that confidence of yours because it brings a great reward. Jesus represents a different way, a more equitable way, a more communal response. The writers urge those assembled to not give up their boldness. Be tenacious, Melon. Write another article about the message of Christ visible in the circumstances of the oppressed of the oppressed. In her book, Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches, our elder mother and one of Caribbean descent, Audrey Lord, reminds readers that our silence will not protect us from the interlocking systems of oppression. I'm positing silence here as a hegemonic tool of oppression and that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They will allow us temporarily to beat the master at the master's own game. Notice I'm not saying him because sometimes masters is she and they. Ah, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. Verse 36 says, for you need endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive, Joe, what was promised. In this pericope, endurance was a principal quality of membership in the assembly. You had to be able to withstand. Faith was not an individual or personal. I want to speak into the mic on this. Faith was not an individual or personal, but it was a collective endeavor. It wasn't about Jesus becoming our personal Lord and Savior. That is an invention. The author is desperate to warn the reader to not break covenant with God. The fact is that discipleship is costly and brings with it hardship. Not only does disobedience have a price in the author's mind, but obedience is also costly. Obedience to a new reign come on inclusivity to a new random a new way of living that centered the least of these that challenged the corrupt nature of empire it is then only endurance that has kept the african diasporan people broadly and african enslaved people in the u.s and the caribbean specifically another meaning then for endurance is the ability to resist or recover the empire will send its strongest minions by way of herbal renewal, AKA Negro removal, <laughs> by way of gentrification and deed fraud. The text says that you've got to persevere because of who you are. So then we get to the last verse. A Hebrews chapter 1039 contends that recalling our earlier days of enlightenment numbs us against the tragedy of shrinking back. The writers are reminding the community that they have the strength to take whatever comes their way because of those that have gone before them. This is why you gotta stop saying, this is not my grandmama's church because you need your grandmama's history. We come from an institutional heritage of men and women who are unbossed, unbought, and undaunted by the fight. Thank you, Spellman. We come from a spiritual heritage of men and women who said, I will trust in the Lord. I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die. Our history is not filled with people who were silent, but it is filled with people who spoke up and out, a people who had faith and are saved. Ah, our unenlightened, other, other unenlightened and problematic emissaries will question your position and speak against your preaching witness. They will become theological adversaries, unable to see that their refusal to be free from Eurocentric and white American capitalistic Christianity that wraps Jesus in an American flag and blesses the U.S. and nobody else leaves them into intellectually vacuous and spiritually impotent. So let's read that verse one more again. But we are not amongst those who shrink back and are lost, but we are amongst those who have faith 
women are saved. My friend and comrade in the struggle for liberation for the people of African descent, Babalao, Dr. Daniel Omotosho Black, shared with some of us in a masterclass that, quote, there were people on the ships who embodied gifts of aesthetics, helps, examination, inspiration, spirituality, wisdom, balance, and healing. He says, we did not step foot on this foreign land as empty slates. He says, we brought with us our physical and spiritual technologies and used them subversively. We masked our religious traditions in the plain sight of their colonized missionary religion. Masking is the two-sided identity performed by a subordinate group within an oppressive society. It is a mode of survival and resistance. <laughs> Masking happens when Black people across the diaspora force their philosophical, theological, aesthetic, and cultural conceptualizations into Western frameworks to camouflage the specificity and the blunt and to blunt the sharp edges of what they are protecting while keeping the core in contact. So we outwardly use the names for the creator that our oppressors had forced upon us. I gotta go, I don't even have enough time. God, Yahweh, Jehovah. Somebody went on Facebook, they said, I don't have no time for this, listen. But we, we, we took these names that our oppressors gave to us while secretly though in hush harbors, uh, physical spaces we created for our own religious and cultural observance. Uh, we called on the names that we'd known and brought with us across the transatlantic. Uh, we were calling on Olorun, the owner of heaven. Uh, we were calling on the Inyami, the eternal one in tree. Uh, we were calling on Ma'u, nothing is greater than Indahomi. We were calling on Inzambi and Pungu, the sovereign of the universe, in Congo. We were calling on Unkulu, Unkulu, the ancient mystery in Zulu. We were calling on Chukwu, the great spirit by the Igbo. We were calling on Saab by the sun. We gravitated toward Moses, toward Jesus and the saints of their tradition because of their ability to lead the people out of bondage. Jesus's ability as a colonized man disrupts the religious and civic intelligentsia to die and live again and the saints role as intermediaries between a believer and God. Okay, okay. You're on your way back home. I'm, I'm skipping it. You're on your way back home. We are all on our way back home and on your way back to your church. On your way back to your desk, I want you to know as the songwriter says, and I think of Joe Fleming, I thought of him this morning and these words came because can't nobody sing this, not even the person who sang this, better to me than Joe Fleming, that though the storms keep on raging in your life, and sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day, still the hope that lies within is reassured and you're going to keep your eyes upon the distant shore because you don't come from people who have shrunk back. Let's see y'all later students. Good, good luck to the football team. Amen. Let me help you. But for those of you all who can stay, let me catch this in for you right quick. Let me help you with this save part real quick. Save here doesn't mean what we've been socialized to understand it to me. We are not from those who shrink back and are lost, but from those who persevered and are saved. Ah, saved here means those who have been liberated from the fear of death. Saved here doesn't mean you're going to live forever because they don't really want to live forever because they're waiting for Jesus to come back. And their whole issue is that Jesus has not come back because they believe in the immediacy of the return. So their frustration is because Jesus has not returned, they feel demoralized and dehumanized because what they profess has not happened. So salvation in this context is not about the by and by. Salvation in this context is how to be relieved, how to be liberated from the fear of the empire that has its neck, its foot on your neck, day in and day out. This I perish, then I'll perish. 
It's about who's going to go with me and be on the front line. It's about who's no longer mealy-mouthed. Salvation in this context is not about how pious you are, how decently dressed you are. Whether you ain't never to, it ain't about none of that. It's about have you been liberated from the fear of death? And when I am liberated from the fear of death, can't no demon on hell or on earth stop me because my superpower is in my memory. My memory, it tethers time to eternity. The memory, it lessens the gap between the ancestral realm and the natural. And when I remember who I am, I hear you, James Cleveland. Then I don't feel no way tired. I know that I've come this far, come too far from where I've started from. And when I remember who I am, then I recite like the psalmist, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? And when I remember who I am, I just know that God has me, let me in in this way. It is good to be home. I step foot again. Let me reiterate on these hollowed grounds and dear old walls. 33 years ago, as a first generation college student, I was introduced to the HBCUs via the movie School Days, followed by a black college school tour offered by a local church in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And in my senior year, Year. at Peabody High School, my appointments with my guidance counselor, June Green, were mostly about my anger and my grief around my mother's sudden move to Miami, Florida. Open that for me. To Miami, Florida. Uh, uh, but, 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 but when I would meet with June, when I would meet with her, she would help me remember who I was. Hence, uh, I had no college plan, Reggie. Ah, uh, my transcript showed it too. Uh, I was a C average student at best. <laughs> I was a C average student at best with principal's list potential. But the way my life was set up, I had more material things than most. I had food, I had shelter, I had utilities, and yet trauma still made its way to me. So while others were choosing colleges, I was searching for myself in low vibration people, places, and things. And by the time I raised my vibration long enough to consider my future, my choices were limited. I remember who you are. Oh, but Virginia Union University gave this girl from East Liberty and Homestead, Pennsylvania, a chance. They bet on me when I didn't have the academic credentials to bet on myself. I had no frame of reference for what to expect. And if I'm being honest, my grades in undergrad followed the format of my grades in high school. Only now I was dealing with figuring out how to remain in school, figuring how to deal with the financial strain. But shout out to Joe, to Sandra Burrell. She was my mama on campus. You always got to have one, someone to look out for you, someone to pull up on you, someone to split the red sea of registration red tape. And it was in my fifth, somebody say fifth, in my fifth and final bonus year, remember who you are, that the pieces of the puzzle started to make sense. I finished the, sum of the first semester of that bonus year with a 3 8 and the second semester with a 3 5 and gone, it was the first time in my life that I had ever been on the honor roll. I hear somebody saying, how can you remember who you are if you never knew who you were? How? But listen here, let me submit this to you. 
again to shift you in your perspective even before I knew who I was my individual and my collective ancestors knew who I was and they knew me by name and they called me to this place I didn't know who Mary Lumpkin was but her spirit knew who I was y'all don't hear me today that the way had already been prepared for me it helped me to be able to go head on to Howard and from Howard it sent me on to the predominantly white institution of Emory University and strapped with the spirit of Mary Lumpkin strapped with the presence and the power of a Samuel D. Witt Proctor strapped with the wisdom of a Dean John Kenny I walked my hind parts right on up into that predominantly white institution and sat myself right on show me who I was and let Teresa Fry Brown preach me happy and show me who I was and as a result I know who I am and I just want to let you know it helps me know why I preach why do I preach let me tell you I preach because despite the Meyer U.S. criminal system posits I don't have the right to remain silent in the face of savage church and government politics I preach because I don't know how to not raise my voice on behalf of the least of these who are they who are us that sit at the dehumanizing intersections of white supremacy patriarchy and unbalanced class strata I preach as an act of resistance and acceptance I resist the backward thinking that relegates women and other marginalized people to the periphery of organized religious proclamation while exploiting and policing our bodies I accept that I am a thinking woman of faith thank you Renita Weems I preach because it is nefarious not to shout out the worth of black lives and the value of black girl brilliance, often referred to as magic. It is worth speaking to the innovation that is black embodiment. Three more lines I preach because I was once a color girl who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough. Then one day, then one day, And I learned that I carried womanist ashe. It's a spiritual power invoked by black women for our well-being from traditional and unconventional sources to unfetter ourselves and our communities from the vestiges of intellectual praise systems. I preach not to save sinners from external forces of evil. I preach to set the captives free even when the captive is me I preach we preach my body preaches through womanist gestures and I wish a ninja would standpoint my breasts preach sermons of anatomical acceptance when they refuse to be disguised by shapeless and non-pink robes that bear tried marks of truth telling and wisdom sharing instead they stand mostly with assistance to proclaim the acceptable day of God let me tell you something I don't know why you came here on this week but I just want you to remember who you are you should hear your ancestors singing as you're driving to the airport or back up the highway oh freedom oh freedom oh freedom over me and before I'd be a slave I'd be buried in my grave and go home come on in here church and go home to my Lord and be free you should hear your grandmama and them singing my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest flame but holy lead on Jesus name 
is sinking. Somebody high five and tell them, remember who you are. Tell them, invest in hope. Tell them, it's worth the wait. Tell them, don't stop. And tell them, I almost. But because I'm blessed before I'm broken, Maximum use out of my life. See y'all later. Because I got a little emotional intelligence and I know how to handle this stuff. So the snake can do whatever the snake wants to do, but God's got the last. Thank y'all for coming to Ellison Jones. I think we're going to see y'all next year. Be blessed. Somebody ought to keep praising. We never leave chapel. We never leave chapel without extending an opportunity for prayer. Listen to me, beloved. I've got students. We have students that will be traveling the highways and byways. They're going to be in airplanes on the road, and we open up the altar now. I want to show you what, what, well, go ahead and do it then. Go ahead and do it then. Somebody, somebody, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Do it, do it, do it. Come on, come on, come on. Hey! Hey! All right, all right, all right. We already out there. We might as well go ahead and take it a little higher. Somebody else who is not ashamed to thank God for everything that he's done, for the ways that he's made, for the doors he's opened, for the... Y'all come on and do this thing in here. Play, man. Provider. Thank you, sir. 
sustainer. Thank you, Waymaker. Thank you, Alpha. But thank you, Omega. Hey, thank you. We're going to ask the chapel assistants to come down now. And this is prayer time. If you need prayer, the